Hello, and welcome back to this Library of Ruinous series. In this video, we'll be finishing off the Urban Nightmare Receptions. These receptions introduce some new mechanics, so let's get started. The reception of the Crying Children is another boss reception against Philip, and unfortunately, is yet another boss that isn't very fun to play against. This is a 7 phase fight, and begins with the unseeing, unhearing, and unspeaking children. They only have one page, Murmur, which isn't very threatening, however, you'll notice that the information of the page is hidden. This is because of the Unseeing Child's passive, which hides all the information of their combat pages. All of the children have a unique passive that gets disabled when staggered. The Unspeaking Child immobilizes one of your librarians, and the Unhearing Child makes it so that you can't see clashes or redirect pages. These might not seem so bad as the children don't have a lot of stagger resistance, but staggering the enemies doesn't change the resistances. This is because of the A Precarious Mind passive, which forces you to win a clash against a certain die that has an effect randomly added to it. Because of this, I'd recommend staggering the unhearing child first so that you can clash into all the pages at once to stagger them. After doing that, the rest of the first phase is a cinch. The second phase is against the Crying Children. Its pages, Distorted Illusion and Bygone Illusion roll fairly high, but get outrolled by most value pages such as Creek, Faint Memories, or Will of the Prescript. Notably, their first and second die roll much higher than the third, so pages like To Where the Prescript Points, Collision, or Execute also work decently because its third die isn't very threatening. Again, this phase isn't too hard. The third phase is very similar to the first, except there are two unseeing and unhearing children. Do the exact same thing as the first phase, and we can move on to phase 4. This one is very similar to phase 2, but this time, there's one more die and a couple new pages. Wind of Sorrow is somewhat threatening, but since it's a ranged page, it can be mitigated by cards like Forceful Gesture, Transpierced, or Tailoring. The boss's other page, Restrain, has a decently strong evade die and a very strong offensive. There are two ways to deal with this page. The first one is to try and outroll a second die with a page like Crack of Dawn or Forceful Gesture. Alternatively, you can try to mitigate the damage that it does with any page with a defensive die on two. This method is a bit more consistent, as not many of your pages consistently outroll Restrain, but it also gives some nasty debuffs so your librarian will be a bit weaker. Thankfully, this phase isn't too hard as long as you're smart with your clashes, so let's move on to phase 5. This phase is very similar to phase 1. Repeat the same tactic and we can move on to phase 6. This phase is very similar to phase 4, except there's one more die and the boss will cast Inconsolable Grief. This is a mass individual attack with a fairly weak 1, decent 2, and strong 3. There aren't many cards that can outroll the 3, so you'll mostly be looking to outroll its 1 and 2. Thankfully, Philip will get staggered at the end of the scene, so as long as you survive this phase, then you won't have a problem. The last phase is against a single child. Just use your pages, and then the battle will finally be done. This reception gives you a new key page. This is a burn focus page with decent stats. I like to build it like a slash singleton deck, as most of the burn pages are slash focused. But you can also move into a blunt singleton deck because of its exclusive page, Blazing Strike. This page is fairly powerful, but can only be cast at emotion level 3 and up. However, the blunt version of the deck might just be a worse version of the Emma variant of Blunt Singleton. The boss also gives you copies of Searing Sword, Feather Shield, and Stigmatize, which I've already talked about, but it also gives you a new page, Fierce Charge, which has a 0.5 high roll average compared to Extreme Edge, but loses the debuff in favor of Burn, so I don't like it. In any case, the key page is the main feature of the reception and is good if you're still using Sayo or Salvador. Now let's move on to the Warp Cleanup Crew. This reception introduces the Charge Archetype, which we'll be seeing more of as the game continues. The enemy's only passive gives them a 10% chance to do 10 damage on hit. It averages out to around 1 universal damage boost with extra dopamine, but doesn't synergize with Charge at all, so there isn't too much to say. In any case, let's talk about their pages now. Energy Cycle is an interesting case. It has two offensive dice, which can be desirable on a light regen card because they often free hit, but obviously, since its rules are low and it doesn't have a defensive die, it's hard to clash with. 
especially since the light regen is on hit instead of on use. That's all for non-charged decks though. If you're on the charge archetype, then this is probably your best option. You might want to add a puppet blockade as your third light regen, just so you have that option if you need it though. Leap is our first charge payoff. It has the same roll average as Gigigig, but instead of restoring light, it expends 3 charge to draw 2 pages. This is an extremely efficient way to draw pages, and it doesn't hurt that it gives an extra haste next scene as an added bonus. Rewind is our next card. This is a defensive focus card that has many similarities to Cumulus Wall from the previous chapter. Its dice roll is 0.66 higher, with its strongest die being the first one, however, the first die is an evade die which I think works in Rewind's favor. Additionally, it gives 4 charge on use and if the offensive die hits, you restore 3 HP. Obviously, in a charge deck, this is a very nice enabler as it provides passable rolls for the light cost while giving you a decent amount of charge. In non-charge decks, I feel like it falls a bit flat though, as there isn't much utility outside of charge and the rolls aren't that high, so I can't really call it a value page. Dimensional Rift is next. It has a fairly high roll average and gives 6 charge on use. This is the best way to get a lot of charge in a hurry. However, you might be noticing a theme because this card doesn't really make the cut in non-charge decks as 2 dice on a 2 cost really needs some utility or very high rolls. The next card is Overcharge. This page has insane rolls with an average of just over 8, along with an admittedly weak block counter die. This page also gives you 10 charge immediately at the huge cost of becoming immobilized next scene. That downside makes this page nigh unplayable in almost every deck. The one place where it can shine is a brawl deck that I can use the insane rolls without the downside. Other than that, you need some way to remove the debuff for it to work. The last card the enemies use is Ripple. This is another payoff that has an interesting minigame. The first die is fairly weak, but if it loses, it adds power to the second die which has an average roll of 14 when empowered with 3 charge. The best way to deal with this page is to have a page with a block on 2, but the enemies aren't too threatening and reception is over fairly quickly so it shouldn't be too much of an issue. The second act has you fighting Rose, Sun, and Lesty. These enemies all have the unique page Rip Space. This page has very poor rolls, but on use it has a chance to give all the dice 8 power based on how much charge it expends up to 99% with 10 charge. On failure, the user takes 20 self damage. This page can absolutely decimate your librarians as its rolls are very high, outrolling basically every other page at this stage in the game. Additionally, if the first die hits, the user draws 2 pages which is a nice bonus, and the second die gains 2 power if 10 charges expended. This payoff is extremely strong and should be slotted into every charge deck if possible. Before I get into deck construction, let me quickly go over Lusty, Sun, and Rose's passives. Lusty has Reaction Force, which gives us strength and endurance if the user didn't use any pages last seen. This synergizes with Overcharge, and you'll find some similarities with Gyeong Mi's passive, but it isn't very good at this stage in the game, as you hopefully won't be casting 0 pages in a turn, but Brawl decks might want it. Sun has the Refraction passive, which gives a 5% chance to deal 13 stagger damage on hit. This averages out to just over 0.5 extra stagger damage per hit, which isn't great. Finally, Rose has Refraction like Sen, but she also has the Quantum Leap passive, which gives a 10% chance to deal 13 bonus damage if her speed is 4 or higher. Again, these passives don't synergize with Charge at all, so it's a bit unfortunate, but the RIP Space card makes Rose the premier option for Charge decks right now. Speaking of, this is how I would construct my Charge deck. I decided to only run 2 light regeneration cards, as my light curve is fairly low, with only 1 3 cost card and 3 2 cost cards. Additionally, if you want to try making a brawl deck, I would probably have something like this. I'm not sure if Rose is the best page for brawl decks, but her passive synergized decently with the high discount of brawl decks. In the end, Rose is a fairly good key page, but is a bit unfocused, which means she might have trouble finding her way into your team composition. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to be covering the rest of the abnormality battles required to move on to the next chapter. However, instead of making fully edited guides like the video you're watching right now, I was planning on making them a bit more like my Queen of Hatred fight example, with a bit more editing to make it easier to understand what I'm trying to say. I'll see you soon, and as always, thank you for watching.